All right, so this will probably be a relatively short video. There was a definitely a hands-down majority favorite topic that needed to be reviewed, and that was the difference between domains and motifs, and very much related to that also the idea of turns, especially the role of proline and glycine in the turn. So I'm just going to take a few minutes here and, and go over those topics one more time, a little bit slower and more deliberately, so that we have a better understanding of what we mean uh, by motifs versus domains and how turns come into play there as well. The vast majority of you did report that you're comfortable with secondary structures such as alpha helices, as well as beta sheets. And just as a very quick review, these structures are held into these sheets by hydrogen bonds. And I'm drawing the hydrogen bonds in now as dotted lines or dotted uh, balls in green. And one of the defining features of secondary structures such as beta sheets and alpha helices is that they are always held together by hydrogen bonds. And so beta sheets, too, are held into these configurations by hydrogen bonds. So what we see here is just a collection of secondary structures. Let me put one more in. We'll have a little bit of a, another alpha helix here. And so these are all secondary structures, kind of lined up in three-dimensional space, oriented relative to one another, to have some function. And so I'm going to draw the rest of this protein kind of as a mess. Let's have a, an unformed region here alpha helix, another beta sheet, followed by a helix, followed by a beta sheet, and we'll do two more helices. And so maybe this is the total structure of the protein. The reason why I've drawn the rest of the protein in purple is I want to highlight the idea that this is one protein, it's one polypeptide chain, but what we are dealing with here is a motif within the larger protein. So two things to pay attention to here. One, the motif exists within the context of the larger protein. A motif is really just a, a collection of secondary structures that are found somewhere in the larger protein. But the other thing I want to emphasize here is that, if we go back to the idea of hydrogen bonds as green dotted lines, the motif is being held into place with some hydrogen bonds, as well as maybe some electrostatic interactions and other things. But the motif is being held into place, being held into the shape it has, through interactions with other parts of the protein. So if we were to go in with protein scissors, molecular scalpels is the term I usually like to use, and we were to separate the protein, you see what I did there? I, I made a break in the chain right here. We are to separate this protein away, I'm sorry, separate the rest of the protein away from the motif, so that now all we have is the motif separate. In fact, we could do some separation, we could run a gel or do some fractionation, we can clear this larger part of the protein away. And so we've isolated the motif. What we see is that we no longer have these hydrogen bonds interacting with anything, these hydrogen bonds interacting with anything, these or these. And because of all those lost interactions, this motif is going to partially, if not fully, unfold. It's not going to maintain its shape. So we go from the motif structure that we're supposed to have to this kind of unfolded former motif in a new configuration. Now, if we live by the rule that structure equals function, if the structure of this motif allowed it to do whatever job it was doing for that protein, bind DNA, bind to substrate, be localized to a specific region of the cell, whatever this motif was supposed to be doing for the cell, as soon as we cut that motif out of the protein and it loses that overall shape that it had before, it will also lose that function. So in a nutshell, motifs do not retain their function when separated from the larger protein they're part of. The reason why motifs lose their function is because they lose their structure. Motifs need to be part of their larger protein in order to maintain the structure that they should have, which then gives them the function that they have. So that's motifs. Let me clean this up a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm going to come back to this idea in just a little bit. But for now, let's clear the entire slate. And let's consider a second protein. That protein also has a functional region, and we can even say that that functional region, whoops, we can even say that that functional region has roughly a similar shape. 
to the helix, beta sheet, another helix, an unformed region. And just as before, I'm going to draw the rest of the protein, very alpha helical here, in purple. Maybe beta sheet, and one more helix. So this is one protein just as before. And just as before, we have secondary structures. Those secondary structures are held into place by hydrogen bonds. That's always going to be the case. Never will you have secondary structures not being held into their unique shapes by hydrogen bonds. That's a given. But if you look closely as I fill in the rest of these hydrogen bonds, you'll notice something distinctly different between this protein and the protein we discussed a moment ago. In this protein, we see that the functional region in blue is wholly independent from the rest of the protein. Yes, it is connected to the rest of the protein because they share a single peptide chain, but nowhere do you see any interactions or hydrogen bonds among this functional region that require interactions with other components of the protein. It's never the case. It's almost as though these two sections or halves of the protein are completely independent. They're not relying on each other at all. So we would call this region a domain. Just like a motif, it has its own function. Maybe it binds to DNA. Maybe it's involved in cellular localization. Or maybe it binds to substrate. But we call this a domain, not a motif, because if we go through the same thought experiment we did before, and we sever these two halves of the protein apart, we break that polypeptide chain. And we go further, as we did before, and we say, okay, we're, whoops, we're not only going to separate it, we're going to clear the rest of the protein away, so we're only left with the blue piece. We see that because we weren't relying on any external interactions, we weren't relying on any forces from the rest of the protein to hold the shape together, to hold this domain together, it retains its shape. This domain does not fall apart because everything it needed to stay in this shape was self-contained within the domain. Yes, it was connected to the rest of the protein a moment ago, but only connected there through an unformed polypeptide chain. Because this structure retained its shape, this structure retains its function. So if this domain was involved in binding to, let's say, ATP, this domain will still bind to ATP even though it was separated from the rest of the protein because its shape allowed it to bind to ATP before, and it retained that shape even when separated from the rest of the protein. That is the distinguishing difference between domains and motifs. Motifs do a job, a self-contained job for a larger protein. Domains do a job, a self-contained job for a larger protein. Motifs, when separated from that larger protein, lose their shapes and can no longer do that job on their own. Domains, when separated from the larger protein, retain their shape and can continue to do that job uh, on their own. So that's the distinguishing difference between domains and motifs. Very quickly now, if we go back to the, uh, the structure that I had showed before, let me see if I can pull that up easily here. There it is. So this is a motif from earlier. It could be a domain as well. <coughs> Excuse me. We see, in numerous places, sharp turns in the polypeptide chain. All of these tight loops are sharp turns. In other words, if we draw this out as individual residues, one amino acid, two amino acid, three amino acids, all held together by peptide bonds, if we see that when we have this turn, this abrupt turn, almost a 180 degree turn, that's a very sharp bend in that polypeptide chain. These are individual amino acids that are held together by peptide bonds. But when we turn like that, we have a very sharp turn, a very tight turn uh, that puts a lot of strain on the protein. What allows these turns to occur, typically, not always, is that they are made up by prolines followed by glycines. So they're PG turns or proline glycine turns. And each of these amino acids, each of these residues, plays its own role in accomplishing the turn. Proline, as an amino acid, has a sharp kink because the side chain of proline, if we have the alpha carbon, the carboxy carbon, the nitrogen carbon, there's the proton that comes off of every single amino acid. 
the side chain of proline uniquely double backs and interacts with the nitrogen of the amino group. This causes proline to kink a bit. And let's draw that more accurately. Because of that doubling back to the nitrogen group, in fact, what's really happening is we have the nitrogen group, the carboxy carbon, I mean the alpha carbon, the carboxy carbon, and there's that side chain kinking. So we don't have a straight bond here, we have a kinked bond. So proline kinks amino acid chains. Proline kinks or distorts polypeptide chains. Proline in an alpha helix would ruin the regular structure of that helix. But if you put a proline right here, you get that natural kink in the backbone of the peptide. That's what we want. We want to turn. The only thing, other thing to worry about here is whatever side group we had in the very next amino acid, that's an R group I've drawn in there, if that's a big bulky R group, that R group is going to push back from the kink. We need something small right after that proline that is going to be able to comfortably fit in what is now going to become this tight space right here that I've colored in in black. Well, if you need a small side chain to fit in a very compact space, what better side chain could there be than the smallest atom on the periodic table? Hydrogen. And only one amino acid has that small of a side chain available to it, and that amino acid is, of course, glycine, the only achiral uh, amino acid that we discussed. So this is the purpose of the PG turn. If we want to say it kind of in layman's talk, we would say that the PG turn is a kink followed by compaction. A kinked amino acid followed by a small compact amino acid that can handle the tight spaces found in that turn. Because proline is the only amino acid that kinks, and glycine is the only amino acid with such a small side chain, that kinked compact turn actually becomes a proline glycine turn. So in general, we use turns in order to allow us to have these sharp reversals of direction that we commonly find in secondary and tertiary structures. The way we get those sharp, abrupt changes in direction of the polypeptide backbone is by having a kinked amino acid followed by a small amino acid that will tolerate those turns. So hopefully this short video clarifies those concepts for you. Again, we tried to just distinguish the difference between domains and motifs for the functional definition of each and put a little bit more meat on the bones of the proline glycine turn, which is in fact a secondary structure. Turns are secondary structures because they are what joins one secondary structure, such as an alpha helix, to the next of the sheet. Let me know if you have any questions. Send me an email, and I'd be happy to do my best to clarify anything from